Oh, man. Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We're here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Our next guest is a chef, an author, founder of the Robert Irvine Foundation, and the host of Food Network's Restaurant Impossible. Show's back and currently in the midst of its 16th season. Folks, it has never been better. Please do me a favor. Make a ridiculous amount of noise and join me in welcoming the great chef, Robert Irvine. Right here, do it up. More, more, more. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Robert. A pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, super excited to talk to you, man. Big fan. How are you doing? How's life for Robert right I am doing amazing. Uh, you said 16, 16 seasons. Yeah. We're in the middle. Of, we're about to go to our last one next week of 16, then straight into 17. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of restaurants out there that need help yeah. and screaming. Sure. And shouting and loving and food and all those things. It's unbelievable, man. You know, 16 seasons, 17 seasons, that's such a, it's an achievement, especially for any show. Uh, but for, for your show, it's incredible to me that it's withstood the, t the test of time. The fans keep coming back. We love watching you do what you do with these people. And I think for me, a lot of that is because I, you genuinely care about the people that you're helping out. And you can see that. And you get a lot of that, especially because now we have the revisited. So we get to see the follow-ups as well. Yeah, I mean, if you think Restaurant Impossible has been on the air for, oh, jeez, 12-something years. Now we're going back to to see those restaurants that, I don't know if you remember some of them, but one restaurant, Cerritos, California, $1.1 million in debt. I went back four months ago. She's turned $3.4 million in revenue after pulling or, or paying off the $1.1 million in debt. So we're doing something right. That's incredible. Yeah. I would be uh, crippled with anxiety if I had $1.1 million in debt. So would I be. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's, it's interesting because if you believe, and, and people say to me all the time, can you or do you know when you walk out, are they going to be successful? Right. The answer is no. Good, bad, or indifferent. Because the ones I thought were going to make it didn't, and the ones I thought weren't did. So there's no rhyme or reason. In, in all of your experience of doing it, has that muscle gotten a little bit better? Or are you, is your, it's, you still, you can't guess it. You never know. No, you, you know, you can, you can think and you can see are they going to learn quickly. Um, I've got some star pupils all over the country, but one we did, we just did a revisit. It was the uh, Country Cow. It's now called the Covered Farm Table Bridge or something. I've forgotten the name of it now. But uh, here's a woman that was married for 10 years. Lived with a guy that she was working with, $300,000 in debt. Her name is Jen. Um, become one of my personal friends, funnily enough. I said to him, you've got a choice. You either give her the restaurant or you give him the restaurant. Somebody assumes the debt and somebody walks away because they were abusive really? to each other. And he came in the next day, plunked a piece of tape, uh, a paper on the table, said, oh, that's it, I'm done. I signed everything over to you. And she just stood there and like, ah. Uh, I just assumed $300,000 in debt. She's now doing $2.4 million in revenue and paid back the $300,000 in six months. But this gets better than this. She never run a restaurant before. Went to school for eight weeks to a culinary college, eight weeks to learn food, hired a chef, fired a chef, then went to another restaurant, a French restaurant, to learn how to plate food. And now she's successful. And she, Last week, she was helping me do another restaurant uh, to pay it forward. That's incredible, man. That's got to be a great feeling for you that, that you go in there and, and you're able to help get that ball rolling. You're able to point these people in the right direction, inspire them, give them the tools. What's that feel like for you when I you see you, that? I will tell you this, Matt. This, this show started, and, and people say, oh, you know, there's Gordon Ramsay, there's Robert Irvine, there's John Taffer, there's all these people doing things. If you look at all of those names and then look at the restaurants that are still open above those names or below those names, and bars. I will tell you, you'll only find one at the top of them. Yeah. Ours. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you'd have said to me when we started this show it was going to become so personal, I would have kind of laughed at you, because it was really about table, chairs, cleanliness, and food. And then it took its, uh, a, a world of its own. It became human. And, and there's no script. I don't know anybody before I walk in the door. You tell me the story. I react the way you talk to me and so on. I was fascinated by that, that you don't you don't have any sort of reconnaissance. There's no research. You like to go in completely fresh yeah. and just sort of respond in the moment. And, and what what is the major benefit to that? To not well, because knowing then I, if I if I don't know you, I'm getting the story for real, and I can tell you whether you're lying to me or you're not. Your book work's going to tell me if you're lying to me, but from your heart, I can see when you talk to me. So it's interesting. 
If somebody says to me, oh, I don't know my P&L, I don't know this, okay, okay, why don't you, it's your business, okay. But when I look at the P&L, and, it's, and the P&L in five lines will tell me whether you're lying to me or you're passing money through, it's really simple. You know, if you want to catch a crook, follow the money, simple as that. Um, but the human stories that, we, that we've come across, um, I have a 12-year-old child um, that was autistic, 350 pounds, we did the parents' restaurant, um, I never get it because I have my daughter. This is how long ago. She was 16. She's 22 now. Um, she was in the audience, and they were about to have their house taken away. Um, I ended up giving her $10,000 of my money. We, the show gave her 10000 uh, straight to the mortgage company so that he could stay in the house. He was going to die. He died a couple of years later. Um, but he's in my show, my live show, that travels the country and the world with the military to this day because he had such an impact on me. We, we think about shows impacting the family. In fact, it really impacts us all. Yeah. When did you, because we see, uh, you know, on every episode, uh, people are always impressed with the amount of work you guys and your team does in two days, $10,000. Physically, it's impressive. But I'm always blown away by the, the mental gymnastics you've got to put these people through. They've got to confront failure. They've got to admit you know, r r guilt and responsibility. You have to have the, the, do these very difficult things and have these really straightforward, difficult conversations. When did you, as a chef, know that you had a skill set to have those conversations, that you could get these people to these places? I don't think, you, as a chef, you have that. I was in the military, and, and the military is very direct. You know, they don't, they don't pull punches. They either call you silly, or there's a few names that go along with that, that, that you can never get away with, by the way, in the civilian world. But uh, I think the military teaches you, no matter what force it is, Navy, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and it, it teaches you a system. And you have to be very direct. Remember, we have a real 48 hours. There's no other time. I walk in, time ticks, we open at 7 o'clock the next night. So it's literally get to the, I break you down, or I listen to you and break you down. You you then either say to yourself, I'm failing or not, and there's a young lady I'll get to in a minute that didn't want to acknowledge that. And then I can build you up knowing what you don't know. So menus, uh, profit and loss statements, staff, talking to staff, talking to your family. Why is the family working? Don't ever work with your families. Oh my goodness. Quickest way to divorce and losing your families. The rest just follows on up downward spiral, but I think the military taught me that more than um, the show itself. And as the show has progressed over the years, I've learned more and more about me personally, but also daily life and, and circumstances I've been in that I put them into when I'm there, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of stuff in there that I want to get to and unpack, but, you know, the, the two days thing, it's funny to me because you guys, uh, when the show came back late, uh, last year, uh, right away, I, as a fan, I could feel there was a, the, the ambushes were gone, the, the feeling was a little bit looser, uh, there, obviously some decisions, creative decisions had been made about how you guys wanted to tackle this show, and I'm curious what those conversations were like, and I always think nobody in any of those meetings went, hey, how about three days? Maybe if we're going to change things up, let's give ourselves a little more time. Like, what were those conversations like, and why stick to the two days? It well, was here's stressful. the thing. Anybody can, do, anybody can do a week. Anybody can do three days. Uh, two days was the magic number. And anybody that says they can do it in less, I'm calling BS. All right? And I'm right to your face right now. All you out there, BS. It's not possible, A, because when we walk in there and we have to pull a permit to pull a light, right? They're, they're, I mean, that's real. So the ambushes was so... It was an idea to take it for another two seasons. It was great. I run in, hey, I'm here. Yeah. They would, like, go crazy. And we would have to... But, but it kind of stopped us doing as much as we could because we were pulling permits the day of, right? And that's real. It was an ambush. It was ridiculous. Um, and the decision to go uh, for the new seasons was cameras have got better, yeah. more, more, almost like 1917, a new movie. It's continual. So Restaurant Impossible, and the minute we walk in, it's continual filming. Yeah. So it doesn't go down. You'll see GoPros, you'll see this, you'll, you know, we've used drones, we use all these different technologies. But the, the core show itself stays the same. We still do the menu, but the menu redos are, are so much more sexy because it's more slow-mo, it's more... Uh, I get to be in the kitchen a lot more now because I walk in and I see what they do, what they have, equipment, their staff, the skill level of those staff, and say, okay, I can actually teach you how to cook 
this menu in two days. And they really do. They work hard. And when we do the, the reveal, and don't forget, you know, they pay. You pay as a customer when you come into the reveal. And I always say to the people, listen, you tip these servers and bartenders, people, because they've spent two days with me. And that's like being a week somewhere that you don't want to be on your life. Uh, and they normally do. <laughs> what um, Have you ever found yourself in a scenario like uh, you, know, you see it all the time where because you're you're having these conversations, you're, you're not pulling any punches. Some people don't respond well to that at first. It takes time. You've got to get them there. Have you ever found yourself in a scenario? You're a very positive man, but there's got to be a time where you've thought, I don't know if I could help these guys at all. I don't know if we're going to make it. Like, do you doubt the process ever? Only once. Really? Can, yeah, only, can, well, I had, I had one guy. Um, the restaurant closed shortly after I was there, by the way, in uh, I think it was South Carolina, North Carolina. And um, you may remember this. Uh, I wear an IFB so that they can talk to me. Right. And this one guy, he said he had the cleanest place. I walked in the kitchen. There was mold on the refrigerator. He tried to feed me food with mold on it. Yeah. Uh, really. And I went crazy. And then he, he kind of stepped towards me, got in my face. And I said, that would be... Two big mistakes you're going to make, right? So if you're going to hit me, you might as well hit me, but there'll be two more hits. I'm going to hit you. You're going to hit the floor. And that's exactly what I said to him. The, and, and all I heard in my earpiece was, if he hits you, just take it. Don't do anything. <laughs> and I look, I'm like, what? I don't think so. Um, and he did. He got, he got, you know, whenever there's fear and you have somebody in front of you, they got, there's so many... The eyes twitch, the body, the neck vein goes, and you're ready for it. You can see he's going to punch you, or at least try. And this guy was on the edge of it. And I said, do it. Be the biggest mistake of your life. And he turned and walked away. But I was ready for him to punch me. And that was one that I thought I could never help. Then there's another one, a young lady uh, called Caitlin, who was in Rosie's. And by the way, a big shout out to Rosie, uh, to Caitlin, sorry. She was hit by a motorcycle a couple of weeks ago. She just came out of a coma. Oh, she just came, I just came out of a Instagram, coma. There was um, a link to support her. So if you, if you see amazing. that, please do. Yeah. Um, we, we got something special for her coming up uh, in the next season, but um, hopefully. But uh, yeah, a guy hit her. Run, uh, she was on a motorcycle, car hit it. And she was the one that was so stubborn that she wouldn't say the word failure. I mean, the whole time, I'm not failing. Well, you live with your mom. You pay, your mom's paying all the debts for the restaurant. Um, since then, obviously... She's gone on to, to do great until this accident. But she wouldn't admit failure. And I had to literally take her to another restaurant, Impossible, and say, hey, you need to sit down and you need to talk to somebody outside of me. And when she came back, and I was so frustrated with her. You could see because my neck, the vein in my neck came out in my head, and I'm like, I don't want to do with you. <laughs> um, but again, she became one of my great successes. But it's really breaking people down to know what they don't know that you can help them with. There's a huge uh, amount of power behind getting someone to say out loud that they've failed or that they're a failure. And I notice that's a big part of the process for you is getting them, not to just admit and be like, yeah, okay, I failed, but to proclaim it, to say it. When did you realize how significant that could be for them? To well, I think in the military, again, it? when, when you yeah. don't know somebody, yeah, I think it goes back to the military. If you can't jump over a, a, an obstacle, then somebody's got to help you. Yeah. Because otherwise, those teammates that, that run past you are not teammates. And the military is all about teams. Uh, and I think that was instilled in me many, many years ago. Even when I, I run Taj Mahal, big hotels and casinos, the same thing. I'm no good unless my team are good. Um, so I think it's that point where, which really put me on the, OK, I've got to break you, but not break you to demean you. There's a difference. I don't demean anybody. I break them to the point that I can build them. And once you start that building, and, and I can tell you, I can put a clock on it. Eight hours and one minute after I've been there, there's a sudden change. And you watch. It would be 20 minutes on real-time television, but it's normally eight hours. And suddenly something drops, and they say, oh, my goodness, he's here to help me. Yeah. Um, and I do take it personally. So you, you've got it, because you've done so many at this point. You know in your head, all right, it's going to be a pain in the ass, but if I get past that eight-hour mark... I know that I'm going to get that. That's usually where it happens. You've got it all yeah. kind of mapped out. You, yeah. you you know the lay of the land. Are there things you can identify the second you walk in the door? I know this is going to be a conversation later. This is going to be a tough thing. If it's a guy, 
and they normally look at you. And I'm not wearing a I'm not wearing a t-shirt now. When I walk in, I'm wearing a, uh, a you know. And they look. The first thing the first thing they do is look at you. I said, "Tell me about yourself." And they just look at you. And they look at your arms. <laughs> and then the the whole conversation to, goes to about well, how big your arms. It's got nothing to do with your restaurant, dude. It doesn't matter how big my arms are. And and there's always a barrier with men. Men are, are really strange. In We're territorial. We're like, oh, well, let's just push my chest out and he's not going to, you know. Right. Except we had one woman, Philomena's, in California, the Italian from Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I learned a whole new language with her. I walked in. The place is beautifully clean, stocked. It was nice. I don't know if you remember this episode, but... Husband was a builder. He put half a million dollars in, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it was awful. The place was clean, but it was. And, and she's like, "Well, it's not me. My food is the best in the world." You want to open a restaurant? Find an Italian, right? Whose mum told them they have the best sauce or gravy. Somebody's going to invest in a restaurant. And by the way, Italian restaurants are the biggest failing restaurants in the United States. Yeah. Why? Because everybody tells them, oh, you can cook great. You should open a restaurant. What they do, open a restaurant. We invite all our friends. It is true. As an Italian, every other Italian I know claims to have the greatest sauce you've ever had. And it's, I mean, everybody's is different, but we all firmly believe my grandmother made it, her grandmother made it. There is no finer sauce in the country. This is the sauce. But there's a difference. If you write it down and you know what's in it, then maybe you can carry that forward from your grandmother. But nine out of ten, we don't. And that's and that was her her problem, you know. My food's the best, and I said, "Well, I got to tell you, your gravy, your sauce, it's not the best. It all tastes like cans." <laughs> flipped, flipped, ah. walked off, ripped the mic out, pretty much like this guy. Um, by the way, he is an amazing uh, uh, guy. The, the the clip you just showed, then his wife, they were getting div almost divorced. Uh, they stayed together, they're doing great things right now. And that's another part of the show. It's it's I'm not there to demean you. I'm there to help you. And and it's families, it's kids. You know, kids don't ask to be in the restaurant business, yet they suffer. So uh, I had a show not so long ago. Um, the two daughters hadn't seen their dad, hadn't talked to their dad for, you know, 14 years. And then all of a sudden we get them in the show. He says, you know, hey, I'm a failure. Apologize to the girls. Now they're back together. 12-year-old son who uh, almost committed suicide based on, and we never show this in the show, based on he... Uh, his dad getting divorced and him blaming himself for that divorce. So there's a, emotion, a lot of emotional things that you don't see that we can't show you because I need to get them help. And I would never put that 12-year-old kid and tell his story that that is do irrelevant. You, do you feel... Uh, irrelevant to the show, by the way, not right, to the post. Right, and, well, uh, and you kind of said this earlier, that when you started this, you didn't expect it to become this personal journey. Do you ever, uh, an immense responsibility, like what does that feel like, a, a pressure? I've, uh, what is that, when you find out how deep these particular problems are rooted in and the amount of help they need, you know, what, what does that feel like for you? Do you get nervous? Do you, get, you know how to navigate it at this point. I, I, I'm nervous every show we do. Yeah. Why? Because we're taking somebody's livelihood and their family into our hands. So you'll hear me say, and, and Tom Burry and the designers, Tanya, uh, uh, Luke, and, and um, Lynn, are amazing people. But every show we do, we want to up the ante, as it were. I want to make it better and better and better. And especially as the stories are so compelling. And you saw one two weeks ago, which was the premiere uh, of season 16, uh, with with uh, uh, Roland, um, started eight years old, cooking in his church, making noodles, uh, and you know worked four jobs. His wife was handicapped with lupus and blind. And if you don't root for that guy, then you're not human, right. you know. And I walked in there, and a lot of the stuff was his fault, but I, I had to handle that really differently. Um, so yeah, the, there's a lot of pressure, not only for me, but then for the team, because I expect. I don't know if you know, but I say this every episode although they try to cut it out. For every hour I'm late, it's $1,000 that I can't give the restaurant in revenue. So that's why I'm so emphatic at 3 o'clock, giving me back or 4 o'clock so I can start cleaning. Because it's, there's no cleaning crew like other shows. There's no, it's me yeah. on my hands and knees, my hand down the toilet or with a bunch of volunteers doing the work to get it open. You know. That's right. If you if you guys follow, on, you guys are always looking for volunteers when yeah. you head out. because Anybody can come, by all means, judge. <laughs> But it's true because it is. It takes a village, man. It really is a whole effort to get these places uh, yeah, up and running, get them there. 
Uh, we're going to go to audience questions in a second because I see we got one from Twitter and I want to get to that. But I, I had to ask you, as a fan uh, of your show and of this genre and as someone who's spoken to John Taffer, I was reading an interview that uh, you guys had done together years ago and then you were on his podcast. And I'm just wondering, where's where's the team up? Where's the episode special that we're all waiting for where you and John People do something together? People have asked me together? and John to do a show forever. forever. John is, is a very unique character. Yes. Very unique. And that's how I'll leave that uniqueness. Um, we're two different people on two different networks. The twain will never meet because mine will not go to him and his will not come to me. Um, I love what he does, certain things. And, and you know, I talk to him all the time. Yeah. I really do. I met, bumped him into an airport a couple of weeks ago with his wife. Yeah. He was just coming back from his vacation in a club. And I'm like, hey, you see that bar? It was disgusting, dude. You should fix it. <laughs> No, he's a great guy, but we'll never do it. You know, it's like saying, oh, will you and uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay do a show? No, never. No. You know, we, we just can't do it. Yeah. So yeah. we've each got our own identities, and um, sure. I, I think that's where we'll leave it. But. What is, this is the last thing I'll ask, because I thought of this when you were talking about busting his chops about the bar, but if you walk into a restaurant, what's an immediate red flag that maybe I wouldn't think to see? Something you go, I got to get out of here. Well, first of all, somebody chewing gum when I walk in the door at the host stand. It drives me nuts. It drives me. I'm, it's like it's it's. And I always say, have you ever seen a cow chewing cud or grass? That's what you look like. That's it. And that's the first thing. It's like servers coming over to you and they're talking. You go, well, I'm um, special for that. You, you know, that's number one. Number two is the floor, and number three is the bathrooms. And I so my restaurant in Vegas. We have one in the Pentagon. We do a lot of military stuff, which you know, but. If you go into my restaurant in Vegas with your child or your boyfriend and you want to make dessert or you want to see the refrigerator, all you have to do is ask the server to take in. I am so transparent. You want to see stuff on the floor. And we, we are a big restaurant. We have 275 seats. So we, we have kids make their own pizza. We, have, we make their dessert. I want a transparency. I want you to see that what I'm on TV doing, I live up to in my own world. Talk, so. talk, walk the walk, yeah. All right. Uh, lastly, I apologize for chewing gum when I came to say hello to you in the green room. I uh, <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to say nothing, but it's no, a, I'm, kidding. A, I'm kidding. It's part of the business. <laughs> Got to stay fresh. All right. First question is coming from Twitter. Uh, it's from at helicopter page. It says, please explain how restaurants are chosen for a restaurant impossible. Great question. It is. Um, it's simple. There are 2,000 um, restaurants that open and 1,000 that close every week in the United States. That's a real statistic. So we, we take um, video applications, also written applications. They go into a central casting. We, I do not pick them myself. There's a bunch of criteria. Money lost, the family story. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And they just say to me, oh, on, like next week you're going to Titusville. That's all I know. Mm, I'll good. show up in Titusville next Tuesday, yeah. and I start a show. Um, and if you think that we're already into season 17, and there's another 20-something episodes, so there's no shortage of restaurants. How, what's your schedule like? How do you... Uh, so I'm on the how, road... How close do you do that? I'm on the road 345 days a year. Ouch. So, so that's the show, but I also spend 150 days a year around the world with the military because that's a big thing for me. Uh, USO tours and, and restaurants and feeding and stuff that we do uh, within that military space. So, yeah, the schedule's pretty heavy. You just did a big event in November for the foundation, right? You guys did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We do well. We do uh, a couple. We do uh, Beats and Eats in Philadelphia. We got one, so it's music and food. Then uh, we got one in LA this year. We did a golf tournament this year, and also uh, we do uh, end of October, or middle of October, a thing called Skyball, um, where we feed twelve thousand wounded warriors and their families. In uh, American Airlines, flies them all in. Biggest hangar in the United States. We turn into uh, a restaurant. And we raise about two point eight million dollars a year on that to give to charities. And it's it, no, it's not the amazing part. The amazing part, we're under tents. This hangar gets eight planes tip to tip. They clean it up. They make you know carpets and all this stuff, and we make it into a five star restaurant. American Airlines, big shout out, American Airlines. Not only do they do that for me, but they also sponsor my foundation um, for four million miles so we can take people and we can do all the things that we do around the world. But uh, then there's Snowball Express, where we take oh, 2,600 kids Snowball, yeah. into, into yeah, so Gary's a, a good partner of mine. We do that in December. So we're always on the go doing a lot of different stuff. TAPS, Strategy Assistance Program for Survivors. And we run uh, uh, every, we started last year, we run a weekend 
of 50 families of fallen heroes. We take to Vegas, we do shows, we do cooking competitions. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big part of what I do. It's pretty. It's an amazing part of what you do, man. It's a, uh, you see all the work that you're putting into it, and it's obviously a passion of yours. And yeah. and I thank you for doing all that work. It's it's pretty incredible. It's interesting. It's a lot yeah. of fun. Everybody wants to get involved. You can. Yeah. Where do they go to get involved? Put, look out. Uh, look up chefirvine dot com mm -hmm. or Twitter. I'm really active on Twitter. Yeah. It's only me you're that does it, active. and you'll know. And you know it's me because all the spelling's wrong. <laughs> People know it's me. My other guys do. My guys do uh, uh, Facebook and all the other things. Um, Snapchat, but I do Twitter, yeah. and you'll know there's no punctuation. It's one with big sentence, and I'm like, Bleh. where does that where, where does that come from that you're so keen to be on? Because you are very active on Twitter. I was looking at your feed, and you engage with everybody, and, and yeah. you talk to everyone. Is that a lot of time in airports? So you're people, just sitting there air, killing time. Airports, planes. Um, I just want to be connected to the people that that get something from the show. Yeah. So we have children three years old that like the design, that like the food, that and grannies, bikers with, with nose rings. Yeah. You know, it's amazing the, the depth uh, of the show and who it hits. And I want to make sure that we touch everybody. So it's literally, if you tweet me, within minutes you get a tw tweet back from me. And that's the truth. I got so excited. Gloria Gaynor tweeted to me this year. It was huge because I, <laughs> I grew up watching her, um, listening to her, but she loves the show. Yeah. Same with Pink. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, is that one of the know. big? Because a lot of people love the show. A lot of celebrities love the show yeah. too. Is that one of the biggest ones? Pink Gloria Gaynor. Pink, what was Gloria another big Gaynor, surprise? Um, I mean, there's a host of them. Yeah. I could I could show you, but I, you know, I don't want to call them out right now. That's but that's fair. That's fair. But we we've done a lot with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, you have. I got a couple in the room. Let's get the questions from the audience. You got microphones out there. The first one looks like it's right here in the front. Go Hi, for Robert. it. Hi. Um, I just want to know what's a good dish to master if you're just starting out learning how to cook. Boiling water. <laughs> you'll laugh, you'll laugh. I'm going to tell you a story. Just do this. All right, God give you hands before anything else. All you need to do is pick a pan off and turn the heat down. If you can master picking a pan off and turn the heat down, you can cook anything. When we sear something, sear meaning in French to jump, we season it salt and pepper, pan has to be hot, then we add the oil, not before. When the pan is hot, then we add the oil. It heats up fast. You put your dish, uh, your chicken or your fish. It takes two minutes without moving it. Don't, you know, do the A and B <laughs> because it breaks the sear. Then turn it over. Then turn it off for two minutes and leave it. It's perfectly cooked. So you've cooked it for two minutes. You've cooked it the other side for two minutes, and you've rested it for two minutes. If you put your fingers together and squeeze them really tight, the blood stops. That's exactly what happens when you cook at high temperature. We have to rest to allow all the juice to go back into it. And it will continue to cook, whatever heat it is, for another 15 minutes. It's not difficult to cook, believe me. <laughs> Duh. I was a Navy cook. You know, it takes Mother Nature, geez, 20 years to, to get a cow. It takes a Navy cook five minutes to mess it up. <laughs> Sorry, Navy guys. <laughs> but yeah, it's it easy to cook. Is that a is that a common because you, you emphasized heat the pan up then add the oil? Is that a common uh, mistake that you come across that? Well, you see I'll a lot be, of I'm chefs. I'm guilty of that. You see a lot of chefs, right? They put a pan on, they put oil in it, then they heat it up. How many people like olive oil? Okay, and there's a lot at home too, right? Olive oil only reaches 325 degrees, then it becomes like canola oil. The goodness is gone from it. Right? Olive oil is good for finishing grapeseed oil because it has a higher flash point. In other words, no water in it. It smokes faster, it cooks faster, it does not absorb into your food. So when I heat the pan up, remember there's pores in a pan just like there is skin. Heat the pan up, we put the oil in, it instantly becomes hot, smoking hot. Put things in, it's done quicker. Don't try and bring the heat up in the pan. It's a cold pan, cold oil. Then you boil food instead of sauteing food. And I see chefs do it, I'm like, amateur. They're all going to get me out there. I can see them all. Like, they're ready. Uh, we've got time. I want to do one more, Kate. We've got one more question. you got a microphone. Go hey, for Robert. it. Hey, Robert. I'm loving um, that shirt. That well, sweater. thank you. Thank you for your service. I have uh, Army parents. Oh, tell them thank you. Will do. Um, so my question is, what meal defines a restaurant in terms of quality? Great question. Great question. Um, I would say... And I'm using Italian or Chinese. Pick a pick a restaurant. What, no matter what the origin of that owner is, it can be Brazilian, Chinese, French. It doesn't matter. 
a classic dish from that country. So if it's veal parmesan, then it's veal parmesan. If it's, if it's uh, um, I'm trying to think of a, a Chinese dish now, egg foo young, right? Something you never see on a menu here, by the way, or very rarely. That's because it's a real or a, a chicken tandoori in an Indian restaurant, not what we classify as Indian restaurants. You know, we've got some amazing Indian chefs right here in New York City that do classic food, not Americanized food. Uh, sauces and gravies in Italian um, are not necessarily what we get here in New York City or Chicago. It, it really depends on the ethnicity of the person and how much time they're going to spend there. Yeah. I don't spend much time in my restaurant in Vegas, but I will tell you, I put a person in there that looks like me, sounds like me, and cooks like me. <laughs> uh, Serious, because when I make fish and chips, you think fish and chips are easy, right? They're actually not. The French fries have to be done twice boiled first, then, then dipped in hot oil. The, chick, uh, the fish comes in from Hawaii every day, wow. every day. You know what they say, if you have fish on a Sunday or Monday, don't eat it. Yeah. Well, ours is fresh every day. We do a curry sauce, uh, a feta cheese, green onions, and the french fries. So, you know, is it classic? I've taken a classic dish and twisted it. So I think, I think once you, you find a restaurant you like, and I'm one of them worst ones, and Justin is at the back, they'll tell you, I like Park in Philadelphia because they have the best mashed potatoes. We use, I'm a healthy guy. I only allow three pounds of butter per plate of uh, mashed potatoes. <laughs> and I love it. Roast chicken, mashed potatoes, my number one dish. And they do it so well. And I go there all the time because I'm a creature of habit and I like that product. Yeah. Well, if you, do you make fish and chips at home ever? It's, it's I'm never home. Fair enough. Fair Dude. enough. Yeah, there's Very in Food Network magazine this week. I'm telling you, they have my kitchen. Look at it. this beautiful kitchen. It took me a year. It, there's nothing on the sides. It took me a year to make this kitchen. I've not cooked in it. All right. Let's forget that you're never home. Uh, what I wanted to ask is when you, you know, do you, you need a house in Florida, you're welcome. It's there. <laughs> yeah. When you do your chips, what kind of oil do you use? <laughs> peanut oil. Peanut and oil. If you, if you yeah. can't have peanut oil, grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil is the highest. Um, Flashpoint. In other words, because there's, if you think about olives, right, they have water, and how, and so do grapes. But when they extract the oil, somehow the water content in the grapeseed oil is very minimal, so it heats up faster and it stays hotter longer, as opposed to cooking with grapes uh, with uh, olive oil. Olive oil is literally finishing. You'll never see me in any of my restaurants use olive oil to cook with ever, or even at home, never. It's a sacrilege oil to an oil Italian. Oil people are going to hate me now. No, we just like, put it in everything. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not getting 8 million from, from you know, somebody give me olive oil. <laughs> uh, Robert, it has been an absolute delight having you here, man. So cool to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for carving out time of your obviously busy schedule <laughs> to come hang yeah. out with us. Uh, congratulations again. I want to remind the world, uh, Restaurant Impossible, it's on Food Network. It's uh, Thursdays at 9. Yep. Uh, and you can watch more online. It's on Hulu. It's all over the place. You can catch up on it. Uh, where, what else do you want to plug before you I go? I just want to check, you know, people can check our foundation, robertirvinefoundation.org. Um, it's not about getting money. It's about spreading the word about what we do. And if, you, if you're available to, to do some stuff, um, I do believe we can do more. Obviously, you mentioned Sinise. Gary Sinise is a big part of what we do. He's a big friend of mine. Uh, and we do a lot of events across the country uh, for awareness. Um, What's the next so, big event? What's the next one coming up? Uh, we have uh, Red, White, and Blues. Uh, Red Wine and Blues, I'm sorry, <laughs> which is in D.C. Uh, we do big USO dinners. We do... Uh, I think called the Invincible Spirit Festivals and all the hospitals. So Gary will play a concert and we'll feed eight to ten thousand men and women on that morning uh, outside. Um, it, it, it's just different. So they're all over from D.C. to San Diego, San Francisco, L.A. Yeah. So wherever uh, you're watching, out there, you can get involved. Yeah. Wherever. Yeah. You, seriously, you can go onto our website. What's the website, Justin? Chefervine.com. See, I don't even know that. <laughs> Uh, ChefIrvine.com, tell you where we're going, what we're doing, what we're up to. Really exciting. We've just got a new executive director for, um, or COO for our foundation. Um, so this year is pretty big. And just so you know, if you see a, a Robert Irvine product, and we have a lot of food products, we have a lot of Fit Crunch and, and, and whatnot, but we also have our own distillery. And the money we raise on that goes into the foundation. Really? And it tells you on the back of the packaging what, what we do and why we do it. And uh, see a lot of vignettes and videos and stuff. So Amazing. Chef, That's it. An honor. So cool to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for the great Woo! Chef Robert Irvine right here. The one and only.